and welcome to your weekly five minutes of intercourse with Dr. Don. Because we all need to talk at least a little about sex. <laughs> Last week, we took the first step towards granting your wish of having the ability to make anyone fall in love with you. We did this by having you recall what it's like to fall in love and by me describing the sympathetic nervous system to prove love is within you. This week, we'll get another step closer to granting your wish. We'll do this by having you think about a loved one and by having me describe classical conditioning to prove love surrounds us. Of all the concepts I've taught in psychology classes over the past 28 years, if you were to ask me which of these psychological concepts is the most important to know, without hesitation, I'd say classical conditioning. First described by Russian physiologist Ivan Pavlov in 1903, classical conditioning remains today the most powerful and far-reaching theory we have in psychology. Whether it's teaching us how to ride a bike, memorize a grocery list, study for a test, or making us like, hate, and love, classical conditioning is the core of our learning. We'll focus on applying classical conditioning to love. However, if you understand classical conditioning's premises, you'll be able to apply classical conditioning throughout your life. Classical conditioning has two premises. Its first premise is, everything we learn is based upon what we already know. Its second premise is, the environment determines what we learn. Let's begin exploring classical conditioning's premises with a thought experiment. All I want you to do in this thought experiment is imagine in your mind a person in your life that you love. It can be your mother, a sibling, a friend, your spouse. All I want you to be thinking about is this person that you love and being with them right now. As you're thinking about this person and being with them, I have a question for you. Why do you love this person? We're evolutionarily meant to be with one another. It's rooted in my DNA to love. Okay, maybe I need to be a little bit more clear in the question that I'm asking. I know we have biological and genetic bases for falling in love. In fact, you know that too. We covered the biological bases for the potential of falling in love in last week's intercourse. But I'm not asking about the potential for falling in love. Instead, I'm asking why we love particular people. When I ask you to think about someone in your life that you love, why did you think about that person? As opposed to thinking about your mail carrier or a coworker or your Aunt Wilma, who always visits you on Tuesday afternoons, has a constant scent of stale alcohol about her and forever treats you as if you're six and a half years old. This question of who we love has no scientifically reliable genetic-based answers. However, classical conditioning provides scientifically reliable environment-based answers. Let's put this into context and revisit classical conditioning's second premise. The environment is not only determining what we learn, it's determining who we love. In the simplest sense, classical conditioning is a model of the relationship between you and the environment. In this model, you are represented as a response, which is defined as everything you do. And everything you do is caused by your environment. Classical conditioning represents the environment as a stimulus, which is defined as the people places and things that surround you. There are two types of stimuli that compose your environment, 
an unconditional stimulus and a conditional stimulus. By nature, an unconditional stimulus automatically causes an autonomic nervous system response. An unconditional stimulus requires no prior exposure or learning. Food, light, temperature, and tactile pressure are a few examples of unconditional stimuli. Food automatically makes us salivate. Bright lights automatically make us squint. Cold temperatures automatically make us shiver. As for tactile pressure, it may automatically make us run away or fall in love. Our skin contains a variety of receptors. One of these types of receptors, called a nociceptor, detects pain. Another of these types of receptors, called a low-threshold mechanoreceptor, detects pleasure. If we're harshly touched or physically hit, the nociceptors within our skin are activated, and we automatically withdraw, cry, or run away. If, however, we're caressed or touched in a soft, warm, and yielding way, the low-threshold mechanoreceptors within our skin are activated. The neurotransmitter oxytocin is likely produced, and we automatically stay near the touch or seek it out when it's not around us. World-renowned psychologist Harry Harlow called this soft, warm, and yielding type of touch a contact comfort touch. Contact comfort touches are associated with bonding and love. Unfortunately, this week we don't have enough time to fully explore the extraordinary benefits contact comfort touches have on our health throughout our lifespans. But I promise you, very soon, we'll spend in an entire episode of 5MI Weekly on touch. Interestingly, unconditional stimuli make up only a small fraction of our environment. The vast majority of our environment is composed of conditional stimuli. By nature, a conditional stimulus is inert. It has no effect on our autonomic nervous system. In order to have an effect, it requires prior exposure or learning. Learning is a result of a conditional stimulus being paired with an unconditional stimulus. Picture again your loved one in your mind's eye, because it's time we use classical conditioning to answer the question why you love this person. To do this, I first have to know what you love doing on your own. In other words, what things do you love doing by yourself? Let's call these things loving things. Loving things automatically cause a sympathetic nervous system response, like increases in heart rate, respiration rate, a pupillary reflex, or changes in blood pressure. Since I cannot hear you telling me what the loving things in your life are, I'll guess them. Hmm. Looking you over... One of those loving things is good hugs. And I'll guess another one is Chinese takeout food at three in the morning. Another of your loving things is running. And let me guess one more. Ah, yeah, you, you love watching the Chicago Bears football team. So how'd I do in guessing the things that you love doing on your own? Four for four? Three for four? One for four? In all seriousness, let me ask you about the real loving things in your life. What would happen to you if you stopped doing these things? What would the absence of loving things cause you to become? I'll give you a hint. The absence of love isn't hate, it's depression. Let's put this into context and revisit again classical conditioning's second premise. One of the people the environment is determining whether to love is ourselves. But enough about loving yourself. 
Let's get back to that loving relationship of yours and finish answering the question why you love this person. Through conditional stimuli being paired together with unconditional stimuli, classical conditioning will show us you learned to love this person. I want you to recall the first time you met your loved one. What kinds of things did you do together in order to learn about one another? Now, if I was to guess, I would guess there was some hugging going on. Maybe some Chinese takeout food in the early morning hours, jogging together after work on the weekdays, and watching Chicago Bears football games together on the weekends. So why do you love this person you've been thinking about these past 10 minutes or so? Simple. You love this person because you do loving things together. Before having done loving things with your loved one, they were like any other conditional stimulus within your environment. They were inert and had no effect on the sympathetic branch of your autonomic nervous system. But after repeatedly doing loving things together, your autonomic nervous system began sympathetically responding to and eventually transforming your loved one into a loving thing. Until finally, according to your sympathetic nervous system, your loved one became equal to hugs, early morning Chinese food, running, and the Chicago Bears football team. I realize classical conditioning cannot explain everything about love. However, classical conditioning makes clear the requirements of a happy, long-term relationship include two people doing loving things together. These requirements have one subtle but important caveat. Having loving things in common with another person does not predict falling in love or staying in love. What predicts love forming and remaining is doing loving things together. What predicts love ending is doing loving things apart. Speaking of ending, my time is nearly up this week, about eight minutes ago. But I think we've achieved our goals of demonstrating the environment surrounds us with love and classical conditioning causes us to fall in love. Consider yourself officially one step closer to gaining the ability to make anyone fall in love with you. Let me end this week's intercourse with a promise and a question. I promise next week you'll be going on a blind first date and I'll be describing the excitation transfer theory, which is the last piece of information you need in order to make anyone fall in love with you. But before I do that, let me ask you a metaphysical question. Now that we know love is within the environment, does that mean if your environment changes, then your loved ones change as well to maybe the mail carrier, that coworker, or even to Aunt Wilma? Thanks for watching. If you could rate this video, I'd appreciate it. Like us on Facebook at 5MI Weekly and follow us on Twitter. If you have suggestions about intercourse topics, then leave your ideas in the comment section or send those suggestions on Twitter to at 5MI underscore weekly using the hashtag 5MI topics. If I use your ideas for an intercourse, then I promise I'll be sending you a free copy of Being, my book on happiness.